All right. Um, I apologize for my appearance. I am about to get on a flight to go to Japan. Um, I'm going to be presenting this seminar, and already I know that you know people will ask their uh, you know I'll present to Japanese patent attorneys, and I'm going to propose some kind of crazy um, ideas, innovative ideas maybe. And um, they'll ask their current U.S. representatives who will have no frame of reference for where this is coming from. They'll think that, you know, they've stumbled onto this great idea. And I wanted to capture this moment in time, um, you know, with a date on the slideshow, the date, on, the upload date on YouTube um, of when I had the idea. Um, because, again, this is I haven't seen this stuff. And I'm pretty excited. This is the uh, at least the most common question I get these days is about um, prosecuting and preparing uh, ap uh, patent applications for artificial intelligence at the USPTO. And this arises due to differences of AI from conventional technology. Um, once we understand those differences, we can look at how we might draft our claim, our specification and claims differently. And then we'll look at the midterm and long-term outlooks for um, prosecuting these things. So what are the differences of AI? Well, conventional computers are trained by instructions, right? We just tell the computer what to do. But in AI, it doesn't work like that, right? We don't list operations. We give it data examples. It has a feedback loop. And... Um, you know, and, and it realizes what is good data and what is bad, or what is a good output, what is a bad output for a particular uh, set of inputs. In conventional computers, the training is deterministic, right? We know exactly what it's going to do. Here is our, um, you know, we program it, to, you know, linearly. But when we get to AI, the training is stochastic, and it doesn't exactly mean random, but Training is basically random, right? You just give it whatever data you have and it learns. Conventional computers, um, when they execute a program, perform many discrete operations. You know, it makes, and we have work, you know, we can say like, oh, here it is determining the user. This is the content we're going to send to the user and so on. AI performs just one big operation, right? It's, it's basically a big mathematical function. And in conventional computing, these operations can be named, right? Like I said, you know, determining the user, selecting the content. But when we get to AI, the individual operations, for example, by nodes of a neural network, cannot meaningfully be named, right? We don't know um, what that, what those operations really are. You know, what does that signify? So how does this inform? differences in patenting, well, for conventional computers, the method of manufacture is irrelevant. It, it actually, uh, it almost doesn't make sense to discuss the method of manufacture. What do I even mean by that? That would be like the programming language. It would be like, oh, if, the, if you know, our method uses a special computer. These are almost never the focus of patents in the United, of software patents in the United States. But when we get to AI, now the method of manufacture is outcome determinative, right? How did you train the AI? The answer to that question um, informs how it operates, what it does, right? Your, your training method is outcome determinative. For conventional computers, the infringement focuses on the method or apparatus or computer readable medium for use. But in AI, it's difficult to obtain a conventional patent on use, right? We'll look at an example in a moment, but we can't claim transmitting, receiving inputs and outputs, right? Those operations will probably be in the prior art, at least as far as an examiner is concerned. In conventional computers, the infringing structure is dictated by the performed operations, right? You know, maybe in our application, it's the client, we call it a client, but in our uh, accused infringers, 
implementation, it's more of a server and we don't, you know, I mean, of course there are litigations if we actually claim a client, but more to the point, you know, it's, we're going to focus on whatever device performs the operations that are in the claim, right? That's not the case for AI. In AI, we actually want to claim the AI itself. That's where the value is. That's what the invention is. And so that's what dictates the infringing structure. So the first question, of course, is which device includes the AI, right? And that's difficult to answer, right? Is it the training computer? Usually not. Is it the users, the end user's computer? Could be, but for cost or computational efficiency, the AI is sometimes located in the cloud on some, you know, third-party server maybe. Or the AI is burned into a chip or a memory that you plug in and, you know, maybe you import into the United States. And do we know what AI technology is being used, right? Do we know if it's a neural network or K-nearest neighbors? Do we, do we want to limit our claim to that? So like I said, let's look at a hypothetical case. Here, the inventors noticed correlation between body mass index and mood. The inventors received information about heights, weights, and moods of 100,000 people. They calculated BMI based on each person's height and weight. They then determined BMI thresholds for each mood, you know, happy, sad, angry, whatever. The inventors confirmed a new subject's mood can be determined by receiving their height and weight and using these BMI thresholds. All right, that's fine, but they didn't implement the invention that way. They invented, they implemented it with a neural network. They train it on height, weight, and mood. And it, when, when the computer receives a new height and weight, the AI determines the mood, All right? And we can see the flow chart on the right side. Of course, we have two options, right? Do we claim receiving a height and weight and um, outputting a mood? Well, that's too broad. So conventionally, we claim the computer that interfaces with the AI to determine the mood, right? We wouldn't really claim S110 here, but you know, we claim the other steps, and that's exactly what our sample claim looks like, right? We just walk through the steps of the flow chart. These are the operations that are performed by the computer that interfaces with the AI. So what if we receive a rejection from the USPTO? Well, we don't really know the AI's operations, right? Did the machine learning unit calculate and use BMI or not? Um, we don't know. And because we don't know, there will be no support for such an amendment in the specification, right? We, I mean, again, it's a hypothetical. If you were drafting this, you'd probably try to include it. But even if you did know, such an amendment might exclude a competitor's different implementation, right? Maybe we say, yes, we definitely use BMI. That's how we know it works. But our competitor might see this and just say, oh, well, we'll just won't implement it with a BMI. And so in that case, you know, our claim would be too narrow if we included BMI. And we might know the structure of the AI, right? I told you it's a neural network, but again, such a, an amendment is limiting, right? What if our uh, accused infringer uses a different machine learning structure? Oh, we used random forest, not neural network. In this case, our first reaction is to claim the training method. However, recall that we are claiming the apparatus that uses the AI, right? And so such an amendment could create a divided infringement issue here, right? One computer tra uh, trains the AI, another one uses it. You know, I don't really want to create this, claim this whole system. And, you know, we kind of have this issue um, where I tricked you on a previous slide, I didn't specify whether we received an obviousness rejection or an eligibility rejection. And the reason is that these issues arise for any rejection, including written description or enablement. And um, I am calling out obviousness and eligibility as very common rejections of concern. And the reason is that they are overcome by amendments and arguments that draw from detailed facts in the specification. I mean, same is true of written description and an enablement, of course. But you can see already that there's this tension in AI between 
the rejections we receive, what we have support for in the specification, and what we're willing to claim from that, as well as divided infringement, right? So in view of that, you know, what are specification and claim drafting tips? Well, not for every case, um, but I think more often than not, maybe, specification should discuss both training the AI and applying the AI, right? If the specification does not discuss applying the AI, then if you claim only training, uh, then you might have eligibility concerns. Why? Like I told you, an AI is basically a big mathematical function. We reject those as uh, we reject mathematical algorithms and formulas as ineligible under current Alice practice. And more to the point, it can be difficult to argue a real world benefit when the specification only discusses training, right? And the reason is, is that we commonly overcome eligibility rejections with reference to real world results, right? Maybe it's an amendment, maybe it's an argument, but that's the sort of thing examiners like to see. On the other hand, if the specification does not discuss training the AI, then claims to only the applying might raise written description or enablement concerns, right? Currently, many inventors think that AI is a magic box that simply works. And we want to show that, you know, our inventors had possession and enabled an AI um, that performs as they suggested. What might this look like? Um, there were training slash application examples in this one US serial number. This was about a 3D printer um, that ships with a um, machine learning unit in it. And when an abnormality is detected by a particular monitoring data, um, the AI learns the effectiveness of particular improvement conditions like lowering the temperature of the cooling water and how much the temperature should be lowered by how much the rotational speed of the motor should be reduced um, so as to uh, resolve the abnormality. In this case, we're talking about example one, it's the temperature rise of the motor. And you know, this is like a chemistry or bio biology case. We have you know just examples in the specification. To overcome potential obviousness rejections, applicants should consider including experimental data in the specification, right? For example, we might want to add comparative examples relative to conventional computing to show how this is superior with our artificial intelligence. Pardon me. So here's a hypothetical invention to stock trading. You know, we've got our AI implementation as example one and our conventional implementation as comparative example one. And we see that our AI implementation identifies more trading opportunities, performs more transactions and accumulates more money. It's a better technology. All right, so how do we clean these? Well, we talked about how apparatuses and methods aren't really um, appropriate because we don't know where the AI is going to be. What if we claimed a data structure, Brian? You said that you know this is basically a big mathematical function. Sometimes we uh, claim conventionally claim data structures as part of a computer readable medium. Right, for claiming fields of an IEEE 802.11 packet. So can we claim this AI with such a conventional claim? Uh, probably not, right? What are the contents of the AI? How many nodes? What are, how many layers? You know, what are the connections between the nodes? What are their weights? We might lack words to describe the contents of AI, right? In a neural network for something like a smartphone dating app, which node dictates that we like fishing, right? If we find that node, what is its value? And so it's difficult to address these problems for our AI, but the real value in a patent is in answering these questions for our competitor's AI, right? And that's gonna be even more difficult to locate the specific node that shows, oh, I like fishing. And even if we can answer these questions for our competitor's AI, the competitor might design around such a structural claim, right? If we dictate like, oh, it's got to have this many nodes and this many layers, um, they can avoid infringement easily 
because even the exact same training data can produce different parameter values in an AI, right? I told you it's stochastic, it's random. So you can just take the exact same training data, rerun the training, and you will come up with different values in your AI. And if you're the infringer, you can escape infringement, or the accused infringer, you can escape uh, infringement. So how can we claim a manufacturer that can only be defined by the process by which it is made? That's just a product by process claim. Um, you know, I, I've mentioned this once to one other person, and he said that, Brian, product by process claims are for chemistry and biology. Sure, but the use of product by process claims for computer implemented inventions predates the use of computer readable medium claims by about two weeks. Right, there's this big summer in uh, 1994 at the Federal Circuit, and they decided in Ray Warmer Dam then. And so this idea isn't new, it's almost 30 years old. And so this really begs that question of like, okay, Brian, why haven't we used this for 30 years? And the answer is that Lowry is the basis for our um, conventional uh, computer readable medium claims. And it's, it was decided just two weeks later. So, you know, I wasn't practicing in 1994, but maybe people wrote warmer dam claims for two weeks, right? This is even before the widespread use of the internet. So I, I don't know, um, but assuming that even happened, you know, Lowry gets decided two weeks later and all of a sudden now you're gonna write your claims like a Lowry claim, not a warmer dam claim. And although this is 30 years old, uh, I really haven't seen this idea discussed anywhere. Um, I've got two cases for you today, but, um, and, and there's a third out there. There's maybe one or two more, but this is it basically. And so of course, Warmer Dam is best known for considering the eligibility of claim one, but it also holds product by process claim five, not indefinite um, under 35 USC section 112. What might a product by process claim look like? Well, in Warmer Dam, the claim was a machine having a memory which contains data generated by the method of claim one. Lowry, again, later decided, uh, would have allowed you to get rid of the machine having portion, and so it's just a memory which contains data. Our more modern way of claiming that is a non-transitory medium encoding a product produced by method comprising, right? And then you just talk about the steps of how you train the AI algorithm. If you know your product by process jurisprudence, your law, you'll know that the patentability of a product does not depend on its method of production. And we can expect that examiners will say this, but if the process by which a product is made imparts structural and functional differences, distinguishing the claim product from the prior art, then those differences are relevant as evidence of no anticipation, although they are not explicitly part of the claim, right? So at this point, you'll think, okay, Brian, you know, I understand that we could have used product by process for conventional claims. And I see how it could be useful for AI. And, you know, maybe people have obtained patents for such claims. You know, it's going to be very difficult to check, right? We don't say the word product by process in the claim. We just, that's just a method of claiming things. And so it's going to be, you'd have to look at every single claim to determine this issue. But courts will use the phrase product by process. So have any courts considered this issue? Yes. In considering validity, the PTAB has found, um, they, they give its patentable weight, right? There may be structural or functional differences between uh, resulting pattern recognition algorithms trained with real simulated or partial data, right? This is an IPR from 2015. Uh, this is a Toyota case. They were the accused infringer there, or they were the um, seeking invalidity. And so Toyota was unable to persuade the PTAB that training a pattern recognition algorithm using different data results in the same product, right? The method of training does change the product. And so more clearly under Amgen, the PTAB are considering the training as evidence of no anticipation, okay? They're doing exactly what we want them to do. This is exactly the result we hope to see. Brian, why isn't anyone talking about this? 
this case is nine years old, okay? We, we're talking about AI now, but AI was not a hot topic nine years ago, right? We were discussing Teva claim construction and Inre Cuozo uh, inter parties reviews back then. Only now are we paying attention to this issue. Brian, that's kind of interesting, but how else can we claim elements and preferably their equivalents without the recital of supporting structure? And by the way, Brian, you did a great job of phrasing my question. Well, I just copied 35 USC section 112F, right? This is just means plus function language. What could this look like? Uh, a processor comprising trained pattern recognition means, um, I, I wouldn't even include the processor here. I would just say train pattern recognition means, and then you know the two operations here, the processing the signal and then applying the train pattern recognition algorithm. This is also Toyota. It's actually the same uh, counterparty, uh, decided the exact same day at the PTAB, they did the oral arguments together. Um, you know, it's related technology. This is Toyota 2. In Toyota 2, the PTAB construed train pattern recognition means as a neural computer or neural network trained for pattern recognition and equivalence thereof. This begs the question, Brian, can we simply claim the neural computer or neural network? Sure. But for many AI implementations, the AI is not limited to a neural computer or neural network, right? If the claim recites a neural computer, the Toyota might escape infringement uh, by using a non-equivalent AI technology, right? Random forest, support vector machine. I don't know if these are um, equivalent or not. Um, it's not up to me to decide. It's not up to the patentee to decide, right? It, this sort of thing gets litigated. On the other hand, um, we can, at the time of drafting, simply disclose those as um, a suitable means. And so a means plus function element automatically covers these technologies as long as they're disclosed as a suitable means in the specification. So what's our outlook? Well, conventional claiming practices are probably sufficient if the AI is in, in uh, this, sorry, if the invention is in AI itself, right? If it's some sort of structural change where we are implying, applying joint embeddings rather than only K nearest neighbors, um, that'll be a very structural claim. We can probably just use a typical method or you know apparatus claim there. Um, if it's a functional sort of um, invention, right, where we're enhancing training sets a particular way, you know, oh, we we can train an AI better when we pre-process the training set. A particular way um, that will also have a lot of details in the claim and it's probably fine we don't necessarily need an um, means plus function or product by process there we can expect that uh, affidavits might become more important some people call these declarations but that's you know we have something else called a declaration in the united states that relates to inventorship and it can become confusing uh, currently, affidavits are very rarely successful in overcoming obviousness in conventional U.S. software applications. Um, when they do, it tends to relate to um, date of inventorship, at least pre-AIA. -AI uh, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen one overcome obviousness um, on, you know, substantive grounds, you know, like um, some sort of, you know, non-obvious, you know, secondary considerations. Um, I've seen a lot of people try though, and at other firms, you know, I review cases for other firms and, uh, I've never seen this work, but still, you know, the USPTO has not yet implemented substantive AI examination guidelines, right? So specifications that we're drafting today might lack information later determined to be necessary, right? Like secondary considerations. And due to differences in AI, this experimental data might become important, right? We want to, the USPTO wants to know that you actually created this AI, right? That it actually works a particular way, that it actually achieves this particular advantage. And so affidavits are the way to submit experimental data to the USPTO, right? And we'll want to know, we'll want to make sure our prosecutors understand how to handle um, affidavits at the USPTO because practice is different for those. Our long-term outlook is that innovations will be more limited, right? Um, 
technical applications of AI will focus more on improving the AI in particular contexts, right? Right now, we're just excited about using AI everywhere, um, but we'll actually start improving the AI itself or improve how it interfaces with the surrounding context. And so claims, therefore, will naturally recite more structure. And as a result, prosecution will become easier. We'll also see the evolution and normalization of AI in litigation and prosecution, right? Um, in litigation, we'll see validity challenges and infringement analyses. And although the USPTO might offer their uh, sub, uh, substantive AI-specific examination guidelines first, of course, they are duty bound to follow the federal circuit. Um, and so we can expect those to change. And when they do issue these guidelines, they'll address everything, right? They should address eligibility, enablement, indefiniteness, obviousness, written description. And um, hopefully they uh, will see some guidance on product by process and means plus function claims. So that kind of, um, that concludes it. Um, you know, we can see the differences of AI from conventional technology, um, how they lead to differences in our specification and claim drafting. We also looked at some midterm and long-term outlooks for prosecution. Um, I'd like to thank you. Again, I haven't seen this discussed, this topic discussed anywhere yet. I haven't seen it on blogs, CLEs, LinkedIn. No one's talking about this. Um, and we can expect that people will ask a lot of questions and I think this will get a lot of attention. So, you know, where they got it. Thank you so much. Take care.